Hi, my name is Lyle Murphy. I am the founder of the Alternative to Med Center, and today we are going to be talking about lorazepam. <coughs> the first question is, what is lorazepam? Well, lorazepam is also known as Ativan, and Ativan is a short-acting benzodiazepine. Its half-life is less than one day, and some it's as low as 12 hours, probably about 16 hours average would be the half-life. Um, it is used for people who suffer from anxiety, people who are having panic attacks. Sometimes it's used for sleep. Uh, sometimes it's used concomitantly with uh, antipsychotics to help someone that's in a psychotic state come down. Um, but it is generally a very heavy hitting uh, benzodiazepine. Sometimes the um, <laughs> dosing range can be as low as a quarter milligram, which is considered quite low. And I've seen it as high as 10 milligrams uh, probably not prescribed at that level. People take it on the street at that level. But six milligrams is not particularly uncommon for someone uh, that has been admitted to a psychiatric institution. <coughs> uh, question number two. Is lorazepam addictive? Um, <clears throat> well, I guess it depends on who you ask. According to uh, Stevie Nicks, when she went through rehab, uh, the lead singer for Fleetwood Mac, she was amazed at how people could come off of heroin and other drugs while she suffered for months and months and months trying to come off of a benzo. Benzodiazepines are typically uh, much more challenging to withdraw someone from than uh, any other drugs probably besides antipsychotics. And one of the things that can happen to people coming off of benzos is not just that they have anxiety or that they can't sleep, but coming off of these medications too fast could actually cause a seizure and they're one of the few drugs that people can die just because of an abrupt drug withdrawal. So <clears throat> the DEA, who um, I'm reading this from right now, classify lorazepam as a Schedule IV drug. Uh, their definition of a Schedule IV drug is a substance or chemical that is defined as a drug with a low potential for abuse, psychological dependence, and a low risk for addiction. So. I think their scheduling is a little bit off. I mean, if someone has a seizure and dies from coming off of lorazepam, is that a, because of its low potential for abuse or its low risk of psychological dependence? I think it's a big problem if you die coming off of a drug. Um, and that could, by all definitions, be considered that it is addictive and that becoming dependent on it has consequences that need to be evaluated by a professional before, um, you know, before you just stop suddenly. <clears throat> okay, number three, what is intradosing withdrawal? Well, with a short-acting drug, short-acting benzodiazepine like Ativan, like lorazepam, what can happen is if someone's taking the medication just at night, they can wake up and the medication has largely left their system, or at least it's not at a dosing level enough to keep them out of anxiety. So in the morning, they wake up and they're in a complete panic. That's called intradosing withdrawal. Uh, one of the ways to navigate interdosing withdrawal is to just spread out the dosing a bit so that you're taking a little bit of medication in the day to help support it so you're not going on this roller coaster ride of uh, medication. Um, question number four, what is the mechanism of action of lorazepam? Well, the drug companies usually say something like is believed to and is thought to and they they try to leave it ambiguous so that um, no one can really nail them down for any exact data and then sue them over it. But um, it is believed to accentuate the um, permeability of GABA. GABA is a naturally occurring substance. And when it penetrates the nerve uh, synapse, it makes it so that depolarization of that nerve is less likely. So it raises the resting membrane potential of the nerve depolarization within the CNS. So what does that mean? That means that you're much less likely to have a stimulating um, nerve impulse, whether it's <clears throat> from anxiety, whether it's from a fight or flight response. And the drug technically is not making GABA. So just like most drugs, it's spending what you already have. And um, when all of the naturally occurring substance that it's spending is gone, is spent, and you're bankrupt, there's the, the, the drug has very little left to act on. So that is what is called downregulation, and that is why people become uh, tolerant to these type of drugs. And some people can go to an astronomical level of taking this type of medication 
much more than I could do. It would kill me if I took that much now. But they adapt to it because of that um, down regulation. Um, next question. Should I switch to Valium? Well, we don't particularly do that here for people. We do the spreading out the dosing so that they're not going through interdosing withdrawal. But for those people who are trying to do it at home, that is a pragmatic approach. Valium has a longer half-life and then generally has consequences that are less um, abrupt. Uh, the medication leaving your system rapidly is one of the um, complications of this particular drug. And Valium can leave your, your body over a longer period of time, giving you um, a longer time to, to have this uh, uh, drug you know, export out of your body. So how to do a Valium crossover is not just do it all at one time, not to just switch from Razapam to Ativan, but stair-step it. Maybe do half of your dosing of Valium and half of your dosing of Valium. There are conversion tables which you can find online. I won't go into those mechanics. But lorazepam is certainly a lot stronger drug than Valium, maybe in the range of eight times as strong depending on the person. So having a professional guide you in that would be um, warranted because getting that dosing level right is, um, is, uh, needs to be followed up by somebody that um, you know, is supervising that. <clears throat> okay, last question. What are natural alternatives to Ativan or lorazepam? Well, there's not going to be a naturally occurring substance that's going to have the hit or the punch of um, lorazepam. Um, one of the things you want to dissect here is to try to discover if your symptoms are constant or intermittent. People who are having constant symptoms, oftentimes they are neurotoxic. So they're, I don't know if it's their only alternative, but their primary directive on that would be to unpoison themselves. If a person's plugged up with neurotoxins, plugged up with what are called excitotoxins, like mercury or pesticides, you know, these things, how a pesticide kills a pest is it overstimulates its nervous system to death. It really dysregulates the way it regulates acetylcholine. And we use acetylcholine as well. So it can do the same thing to us, particularly if we have a bad hand genetically and cannot, um, we don't have the, we have a genetic polymorphism that doesn't clear those organophosphates. So if a person's suffering all the, the time, like their, their nervous system feels like they're sitting in the middle of a freeway and they can maybe meditate themselves to the top of the mountain, but d their nervous system still feels like it's sitting in the middle of that freeway, that's probably neurotoxic poisoning. And so the alternatives for that would be unpoisoning. Um, other natural alternatives, especially for people who are having intermittent anxiety, are, um, well, cortisol levels. Um, some things that uh, also can help uh, are agashawanda, uh, tryptophan, theanine, taurine, valerian root, passion flower. These are more natural anxiolytics. Um, to get a more robust perspective on that, either visit the website where we cover those things under lorazepam alternatives, or go to a naturopath who can maybe guide you in natural alternatives. Your naturopaths and your integrative doctors are going to be a lot more... Um, well-versed in things than maybe your psychiatrist when it comes to natural alternatives. And I want to thank you for watching today's session. And if you have any further questions, please contact the Alternative to Med Center. But do not take anything that we've said here today to be medical advice or change in medications based upon what you've heard here. Consult with a licensed physician who has a relationship with you or with us and have us establish that doctor-patient relationship. Thank you very much and have a good day or evening.